weekly live educational series uh, covering the COVID-19 crisis and the global community's efforts to develop a vaccine against the disease. Thank you so much to everyone who tuned in last week. We had a truly global audience with viewers from the US to India, Spain, and Brazil. It's such a reminder that what's happening is global. This is an unprecedented moment in history when the entire population, the entire world is engaged and just hungry to know as much information as possible from expert sources. And that's what this show is all about. We wanna provide the most up-to-date scientific information so we can all better understand what's happening. Today, we have someone who 40 years ago doc worked with Dr. Tony Fauci to slow the spread of AIDS. We'll talk to her about the parallels between that fight and the one that we're in now. Then we'll go straight to the source, Dr. Paul Stoffels, the J&J &J scientists leading their vaccine efforts, will give us the latest on what's happening in their labs. And the United States has become the epicenter of COVID-19 cases. We all know this. We have surpassed all other countries in infections and deaths. One group of Americans is being disproportionately affected. And for more on that, we'll be talking to Dr. Cato Lorenzen, who recently published the first peer-reviewed study on how COVID-19 is impacting the African-American community. If you have questions, please share them in the comment section, and I will be asking them throughout the show. We start with Dr. Peggy Hamburg. She's the former FDA commissioner and current foreign secretary at the National Academy of Medicine. As health commissioner for New York City in the 90s, she curbed the city's tuberculosis epidemic, and she has worn so many hats in the public health arena that I thought she'd be the best person to answer so many of the questions we have now. Welcome, Dr. Hamburg, to the show. I, I want to get right to it uh, and take you back to 40 years ago. Uh, even though I was quite young at the time, I, I will never forget the images of the AIDS epidemic. And in those early days, HIV, like COVID-19, was spreading among individuals who appeared to be asymptomatic. You worked with Dr. Fauci to help slow the spread of AIDS. How did you go about doing that? And are there lessons that can be learned uh, and, and applied to COVID? There are lessons to be learned. And I think it gives us reason for optimism. Certainly no one expected the HIV epidemic to emerge. In truth, when I was a medical student, I learned that the era of infectious diseases was more or less behind us because of the advent of antibiotics and vaccines. And then we watched this mysterious disease emerge, taking the lives of previously healthy young adults. Um, as I went through my medical training and I saw more and more the devastation of the disease and we didn't have the medical tools to do much for these patients beyond just supportive care, um, I decided I really wanted to work on these issues. And that was when I had the fabulous opportunity to work as uh, first Dr. Fauci's uh, special assistant and then as assistant director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And some really important things came out of that. One was that uh, Dr. Fauci, Tony as we all call him now, um, really believed in uh, going deep into the science but also understanding the impact on people. And he did something that was very unusual at that time, which was to reach out to those affected and really understand their disease experience and bring them to the table and work together, bringing industry, academia, the government, research and science community, NIH and FDA in particular, and um, the HIV affected community all together to develop a strategy for what needed to be done and then to implement. And it really has made a difference. And now what was always a lethal disease is a manageable chronic disease. And do you feel like similar levels of, of, of collaboration uh, is happening now? Well, I do feel there are gaps in leadership, gaps in the ability to really galvanize the best and the brightest minds, the, the available science and technology, and the set of stakeholders and partners that are needed to really deliver on that promise of science. This is obviously a, a broader issue than just what was happening under the leadership of Dr. Fauci 
in the HIV research and product development arena uh, because it, in, it involves many other, other players, but that was true for HIV as well. And, um, you know, and thankfully, Dr. Fauci is still with us playing that critical role. But, but we need really, I think, a, a clearer strategy. We need to really define who is responsible for what. We need the federal government to step forward and take on more responsibility and accountability in critical areas. We need to define then the role of state and local governments, the private sector, and the broader uh, communities um, so that we can really make that necessary and urgent forward progress. I, I said earlier that you have worn so many hats in the public health arena. I wanna talk about your experience as health commissioner in New York, working in, in, in public health during a, an epidemic. Uh, in that case, it was tuberculosis. What were some of the defining factors and approaches to overcoming TB in New York City? Yeah, well, my experience with TB was shaped by what I learned with HIV and I think is relevant now. Of course, the resurgence of tuberculosis that we faced in, in New York City was much smaller than you know what uh, that city and so many others are grappling with now, but TB remains a worldwide public health challenge with many people's lives lost around the world and actually Dr. Stoffels, who you'll hear from later, has been a great leader in, in the development of new products for TB, but a couple of critical lessons from our TB experience. One is you need data. You need to understand what is the, the nature of the foe that you're dealing with, and for that, you need testing. We didn't realize we had such a big resurgence of tuberculosis back in the 1990s, and importantly, we didn't realize how um, many of the cases of tuberculosis that we had were actually drug resistant. So we weren't even treating them correctly. We weren't diagnosing adequately and we weren't treating correctly. So some studies were done that allowed us to get a, a better sense of the problem before us, the contours of this unfolding epidemic. We then, under the leadership of then Mayor Dinkins, actually did what I was talking about. We brought together all of the different stakeholders across the city. We, we achieved a common level of understanding about the nature of the problem and presented our strategic plan, which was very simple. It was uh, diagnose the cases, make sure that the cases are properly treated, which with TB is hard because you have to treat um, on a regular basis over a prolonged period of time. Uh, so we act to actually send community workers out to find patients to make sure they were taking their medicine, and then to reduce some of the social settings that actually exacerbated the disease. So looking at prisons and jails, looking at congregate shelters, looking at, at hospitals and other congregate settings as well, so that we could reduce the conditions that contributed to ongoing transmission and spread. And with those three critical goals and objectives, an understanding of, of the responsibilities of all the different components of, of success um, in terms of stakeholders and partners, we actually were able to turn the tide on TB far more quickly than we ever expected. And actually our, our programs became a model for the nation and other places in the world as well. Well, that's the thing about COVID-19. There is still so much that is unknown about this virus, yet the federal government has been talking about this three-phase uh, approach to returning to normal. But as you said, testing is crucial. So we've been hearing so many mixed messages. Where are we with testing? And are we where we need to be? Yes, well, unfortunately, we did get off to a slow start with testing in this country. And we've been, I think, scrambling to catch up ever since. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that we are at another inflection point where we will have more uh, testing available. And it's not just having the diagnostic tests, but it's also having the tools you need to administer those tests, the swabs and the reagents for the tests. And there have been shortages of those. 
So we, we have to keep our eye on the importance of testing. Then we have to use that testing properly, both to make sure that all those who are infected, those with symptoms that are infected, uh, are, are tested, they're isolated so they won't continue to spread, and they importantly get the care that they need. Then we also do need to be doing some, some testing, what we sometimes call sentinel surveillance, so that we have a better sense of how the virus is penetrating into our communities, still perhaps silently, so that we can know where there may be uh, new outbreaks of disease. So we, we, we really do need to get on the ball with the testing. And, you know, we are a country with enormous resources and, and huge um, uh, scientific and technological capacity. We can and must do a better job, and I think we will. Well, that, that's the thing, though. How reliable is the testing? There was recently contamination at the CDC. We've been hearing about how tests are sitting around too long and indicating false negatives. Um, you look at a country like Korea that just they, they developed these tests and were able to disseminate them so widely. Why is it so hard in this country that you say is so, so developed and, 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 and has so many resources? Well, in all honesty, it has been a bit of a mystery to me why this has been uh, so hard. Obviously, we're talking about a scale that is unprecedented, but it is such an important reminder when we talk about testing and diagnostics, but also when we talk about drugs and vaccines, that it really matters to evaluate whether the tests work. You've got to develop them and manufacture them, um, of course, but it's more than that. And people sometimes think that regulation, like the Food and Drug Administration, which I once had the privilege of being the commissioner of, um, that they just get in the way, that they're barriers to innovation. But the truth is that new products and innovation only matter if they make a difference for people. And if they don't work, if they don't do what they say they can do, then they don't uh, improve people's health, they don't advance the health of populations, and in fact, people as individuals and the healthcare system uh, don't have the tools that they actually need to combat a disease as devastating as COVID-19. Dr. Hamburg, I have a, a question from a viewer on Facebook who asks, is the COVID-19 crisis uh, phenotype similar to HIV and that it will change constantly and therefore developing one universal vaccine is wishful thinking? Well, COVID-19 is a disease produced from a virus, as is HIV, but they're very different viruses. Another similarity is that they are both um, complex diseases that affect the body in many different ways and produce, as we learn more about them, different manifestations. In the early days of HIV, uh, we thought we understood a set of symptoms uh, associated with it. And then we learned that there were, there were more and different ones. And the same is happening with COVID-19. It certainly is more than just a respiratory disease. And that creates new challenges in terms of how best to treat it. Um, I am more optimistic that we're going to have a vaccine for COVID-19 because of the nature of the virus and the, the opportunities to target uh, certain portions of it to produce an antibody response and a, a robust immune response and ultimately a vaccine. Um, HIV, the challenge of developing a, a vaccine has been very elusive, but we've been very, very effective on the drug therapy side and have been able to, as I said, change it from a always fatal disease to a chronic manageable disease now through um, drugs that, that target the virus and its life cycle. Well, speaking of vaccines, I want to take this opportunity to ask you about the, the process of FDA uh, approval. You were the former FDA commissioner. Um, that, that's the ultimate goal, right? To, to get your vaccine approved by the FDA. So, so what does that process entail and how much collaboration happens between the FDA and the companies developing vaccines? Yes. Well, vaccine development is, is usually a long and pretty complex process, and it's often a 
uh, risky uh, process as well, because at the end of the day, you're developing a product that you're going to give to people who are healthy to protect them from getting a disease. So the last thing you want is to have safety issues that make people worse. And of course, you want to have a product that will, in fact, protect them from that infectious disease threat. So ideally, as a company is starting to develop a vaccine, they begin to talk with the FDA about what the vaccine is and, and their um, research and development plans. And the FDA gives them feedback about what kinds of of important questions need to be asked and answered in terms of their studies and the data collected. Generally, vaccine uh, development happens in a very stepwise process, sort of assessing each step of the way, because companies don't want to make a lot of investments if they're going to fail. With the, And you start with testing safety in a relatively small number of, of healthy people, and then you start to move it out into clinical settings where you get exposed, uh, where people who are vaccinated get exposed to um, uh, the infectious disease threat that, you know, in the course of an ongoing outbreak or circulating um, uh, infectious disease, and you assess the treated group compared to a control group to see if the vaccine is is protective. And that can all take a long time and involve quite a number of subjects. In the case of COVID-19, because of the urgency of the problem and the, the magnitude of it, um, many of the steps are, are really sort of being collapsed and people are, are willing, companies are willing to move more quickly. And even as many, many different candidate vaccines are now under development and going into human studies, people are already thinking about how are we going to scale up and manufacture in the, the volumes that are going to be necessary to address a global pandemic. So we're going in record speed from the time that the, the genome of this novel coronavirus was first posted in early January by Chinese scientists to the first injection of a vaccine candidate into a human. It was just a little over nine uh, weeks, which is an absolute record in terms of vaccine development. We're seeing rapid progress. Everyone has their fingers crossed. There's been unusual collaboration across all sectors and across borders. You know, really the mobilization of the scientific community to try to address this problem. Everyone recognizes that at the end of the day, it is a successful vaccine or vaccines that will really provide the, the blanket of protection that we need to make us go back to some kind of new normal again. Well, we, we will be talking about uh, vaccine manufacturing uh, with Dr. Stoffels, but I, I just wanted to ask you, uh, will the FDA approve more than one vaccine? The FDA will approve any and all vaccines that are proven sufficiently safe and effective to make a difference against this devastating disease. I think the goal would be to have more than one vaccine. There are a number, there, there are about seven different broad categories of vaccine that are being developed using different strategies, approaches, and platforms. And there, there are you know well over 70 different candidate vaccines that are in active development and there probably will be more. So out of that pool, you know, we all hope that there will be some options and that there may be some different strategies and that we may also learn in the process of these vaccine development efforts more about new, better ways to make vaccines for the future as well. Well, the FDA has a, a, a big job ahead of it. Dr. Hamburg, thank you so much for your expert insights. Now, in case you're just joining us, thank you. In case you're just joining us, I'm Lisa Ling, and this is The Road to a Vaccine, a weekly exploration of the COVID-19 crisis and the global community's efforts to develop a vaccine against the disease. I want to remind you to ask your questions in the comment section, and I will try to get through as many as possible.
And now for Vaccines 101, which is a deeper dive into the basics of the vaccine process. Last week, we talked about what it takes to get a vaccine to clinic. Today, we're talking about how a vaccine gets manufactured. Earlier today, I went directly to the source, Dr. Paul Stoffels, who's in Belgium and is J&J's vice chairman and chief scientific officer, uh, is going to tell us uh, more about what's happening in the labs right now. So Dr. Stoffels, you and your teams are working around the clock to get a potential COVID vaccine to patients as soon as possible, but you're also trying to upscale the manufacturing. Why is it important to do these things in parallel, particularly as it relates to this COVID vaccine? Well, as we all know, COVID is global and, and, and affects all the people in the world. There is almost no region not affected. And that's where a massive upscaling is needed to when there is a vaccine which works and it needs to be available to many, many people in the world, we need to have hundreds of millions, if not more than a few billion vaccines. And that's where upscaling and the preparation for upscaling is very, very important that it's started now to be ready when the vaccine is ready uh, from the clinical trials. So you start uh, upscaling the manufacturing even before the vaccine is ready? Well, we start the vaccine upscaling at the moment. Well, we only know that it works in animals. We not, have not tested it yet in humans. That will start in September. But in the meantime, we are already working on the preparation for very large quantities. That consists of two pieces. One is upscaling biologically. So we go from a 50 liter to a 1,000 liter. We validate that. We do the quality on that. And that 1,000 uh, liter vessel can give 150 million vaccines a year. Um, and now we are also building more vessels in the world. So we build a new manufacturing plant in the US. We are working on, on more with partners in the rest of the world in order to get to a capacity to make a, more than a billion vaccines a year. And hopefully we'll be ready early next year to go to that level of 1 billion vaccines a year. Have you ever produced this quantity of anything before? No, in laboratory circumstances to test our technology, we have gone up to producing 300 million vaccines that we have done already. So we know that we can do it. We have a cell line, what is called the Persis 6 cell line, which we have been developing for the last 10 years with our vaccine platform. And we know that we can make 300 million in a 2,000 liter capacity. So two times 1,000 liter, two times 150 million vaccines uh, per, per, uh, per plant per year. And that gives us the confidence that if we multiply the plants, then if we have four of those plants, that we will be able to, uh, to make more than a billion vaccines. Also in early testing, we have already in the laboratory demonstrated that we get to huge yields in our, on our manufacturing uh, cell line. And the combination of that makes us confident that we will be able to scale it up to very large quantities. It's incredible. Uh, can you describe the process of how vaccines are, are typically manufactured and, and what kinds of technologies do you use? Vaccines are used to be uh, produced on eggs, yeah, so a very ant antiquated uh, system, but still uh, used today for, for several influenza vaccines. And then they use the eggs to grow the virus and then they the people host the virus and, and inactivate the virus. Um, we now use cell lines for different types of vaccines. For example, vector-based vaccines, what we do where we use an, an adenovirus vector, we, um, we, it's, it grows very well on a very particular cell line, the Persis 6 cell line, which we have developed for that. Uh, protein type of vaccines, you can make them on cell lines. Some other vaccines are made in bacteria. So there are different platforms for different types of vaccines on how to get them produced. And all of them use different technology and uh, different environments to be produced. What would you say is, is special about your manufacturing technology? Yeah, what we have been working on because we were focused on pandemics before with Ebola, Zika, uh, HIV, RSV, we have very particularly focused on an extreme high productivity cell line, which allows for extreme high output. You know? And that's where we have been able to uh, to respond so fast to this, uh, to this epidemic and previous epidemics that we have a cell line which can do that, as well as the combination with the vector, which together with the cell line forms, in fact, one technology. You can use both. To, if you use them together, you can make good vaccines as well as scale them up. And that's where uh, we have a very particular technology to do this. And what kind of capacity does that require? Well, it requires um, 
if you would see the space, it's not that large, but if you see the technology, it's very complicated from a, both from a technology perspective, but also from a biological perspective. This type of cell line and the manipulations you do to such a cell line is high tech. It's like uh, the, one of the most advanced type of biological interventions you can do. Also, the development of a vector where you use a virus to carry another piece of, an, of, a, of the virus you want to make a vaccine against is one of the most advanced technologies you can use in, in the current environment. Yeah? And so it took um, probably three, four hundred researchers uh, 10 years to get to this point. Um, we have a very extensive academic uh, group, which uh, uh, met with Dan Baruch, who has been collaborating with us, so as well academic research. Uh, we have worked together with the US military, with NIH, uh, all in partnership to move this type of technology forward to enable to combat pandemics. We have focused on influenza because that's one of the most dangerous viruses next to Corona. And so we have, we, that gave us the experience and, and, and drove us to making and optimizing this technology. There are a lot of people who are very concerned about vaccines to begin with. How, how can you ensure that your vaccine will be safe? One, the vaccine is not a virus. It's a biological, um, it's dead. It's a biological carrier, but it's not a virus. Uh, so it, it will not replicate in your body. It will add, um, it will it will bring a piece of the virus into your body, and which is a small piece, which typically is not toxic, and it generates the antibody. Um, second, we have tested this vaccine technology in four or five different diseases already, and we vaccinated up to now, recently added another 10,000 people, uh, so we have now 60,000 people who have been vaccinated with uh, technology already, with minimal side effects. Overall, vaccines are are probably the most effective way to prevent diseases. And I know very many people are scared from vaccines, uh, but vaccines prevent today um, many diseases from your childhood, um, measles, um, mumps, rubella, uh, hepatitis now, all types of diseases are out of our life because of a vaccine. And so vaccine has been one of the most important technologies to bring the life to where we are today on if, in eliminating diseases from our society. Yeah, today there is no polio anymore. Where is that? Why is that? Because we had a vaccine. There are no cowpox anymore because um, we, we have a vaccine. So it's all thanks to vaccine technology that we are who we are today and can live healthy lives. And we know now that we need many more vaccines to protect ourselves to next diseases, now like COVID or Zika or other diseases which appear out of the blue. And that was Dr. Paul Stoffels, J&J's Chief Scientific Officer with whom I spoke earlier. For those of you just joining, I'm Lisa Ling and we're back with you live. I wanna encourage you all to ask questions in the comment section and we will be answering as many as we can. Our next segment explores what I think is one of the most concerning and devastating aspects of the crisis, how COVID-19 is impacting black and brown communities in this country. My next guest is Dr. Cato Lorenzen from the University of Connecticut. He's a professor and surgeon, and he recently published a study that found significant differences in the way COVID-19 is impacting communities of color. Dr. Lorenzen, thank you so much for being with us. What is your perspective on COVID as a surgeon, engineer, and physician uh, in the community, and how has COVID impacted you? Well, Lisa, thank you. First, uh, I want to thank you for having me on. I do want to take a moment to uh, thank all the first responders and for what they've been doing, uh, especially at the University of Connecticut. Uh, you know, they are, have been truly heroes from those working in the emergency department to those working in the ICU. Um, but also the staff the, of the, the police, janitors, uh, other essential employees, they really have shown uh, their true colors in, in, uh, in their work. And so I think that, that we need to have a tribute uh, to them. Uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic has had really a devastating effect in terms of the black community and, um, and, uh, and, and we sort of, it, we, you, people have asked me, how did this all start in terms of uh, our writing our first paper in this area? 
And it really came about uh, in March when I looked on the internet. Um, and if you, if I placed the keywords COVID-19 and blacks, I found that uh, most of the internet uh, uh, passages were, can blacks get the, the coronavirus? Uh, are blacks immune to the, the coronavirus? Um, and this was really uh, very surprising to me that that would be on the internet at that, at that point, but also frightening to me because uh, that type of misinformation in the black community could be deadly. Uh, and that's what really prompted uh, our moving forward to get the information and to write the first paper uh, on COVID-19 and the black community looking at real data uh, on that uh, on, the, on the black community. Um, Interestingly enough, we went to the state of Connecticut uh, Department of Public Health to talk to them about getting the data, and the data was not available on the website. Um, and we actually had to go through a number of different steps to be able to obtain the data, data including signing release forms, et cetera, to be able to obtain the data. Um, when we uh, found the data, when the data was brought to us, uh, we were equally shocked that um, only a percentage of individuals who were tested um, had race and ethnicity data that were that were logged. Uh, and this was, again, extremely concerning. And we've actually found across the country that race and ethnicity data is actually um, is actually uh, is actually very, very low. Um, and so um, the uh, the the pandemic has has really specifically and in, in, uh, affected the black community in ways that uh, are far reaching and and uh, and yeah and I think ways that we'll be seeing you know for years and maybe even generations to come. And so you published a study about COVID impact on communities of color. What were your findings? Well, our findings were that uh, compared to the uh, to the general population to the the overall population that blacks had higher rates of, uh, of coronavirus infection and also higher rates of, uh, of uh, coronavirus uh, deaths. Now, this is in the context of the internet in which at the time in which we were putting together the study had uh, questions, uh, placed questions as to whether blacks were, were immune. Uh, in fact, in the state of Connecticut, death rates per 100,000 of uh, blacks versus whites are twice as high for blacks and whites, and coronavirus infection rates are 30% higher in blacks than whites. Um, and um, we're seeing this, of course, across the country now. It's been reported after our paper, it's been reported across the country that other centers and other sites and other hotspots are having these sorts of rates. So it was actually the opposite, your findings of what you initially saw on the internet, that, that blacks had immunity. Uh, did you expect to find the results that you did in your study? We we did, and that's that's what prompted us to to try to dispel the 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 myth and also to address the misinformation that was taking place in the black community. Um, we know that there are a number of contributing factors that um, that take place in the black community, making individuals more susceptible to to disease and death by coronavirus. And these are all under the the general area of discrimination and racism that's taken place over over hundreds of years in terms of America and continue today. And so uh, we know that uh, in terms of areas of comorbidities, in terms of hypertension, uh, uh, asthma, COPD, diabetes, these rates are higher. And there are a lot of factors that are even behind those. You know, uh, one compares blacks versus whites in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, health insurance. Blacks are twice, uh, twice uh, more likely to not have health insurance. Uh, have higher rates of um, of situations in which uh, uh, a doctor visit doesn't occur because of because of cost, um, and so we know that in terms of housing, the history of housing discrimination has taken place uh, in America has been going on for uh, you know for you know over a hundred years, and in fact the, the last anti housing discrimination uh, laws were actually passed in the 1990s, if you believe it, 1990s. And so, uh, in terms of housing that uh, has uh, areas such as uh, food and you know, proper food, proper groceries, proper medical supplies, uh, these are low in the black community. Um, and also, of course, we know that in terms of uh, the concept of the essential worker uh, uh, in the 
work that uh, that can't be done at home. Uh, higher rates of there are higher rates of blacks who cannot work at home and cannot be uh, sheltered in place and are so and are working in uh, outside the home during this period of time and working in hazardous you know positions. Uh, I saw one uh, one quote that 60% of nurses aides in nursing homes, which of course is a are hot spots in and of themselves. 60% of nurses aides working in nursing homes and uh, nursing homes are black, and so. Uh, this provides another another level of uh, of, of uh, concern, and of course, with the misinformation about coronavirus, uh, and that misinformation goes on even even now in terms of uh, in terms of what the proper protection is and whether one can shelter, should shelter in place or not shelter in place. It creates an environment in which uh, it can be the it can be an environment for disaster for the black community. You're talking about some of these just devastating yeah, yeah. systematic <laughs> challenges in communities of color, but from a health perspective, um, why are African Americans at a higher risk to severe infection with COVID? Well, again, it's I think that the, one is, of course, is that this is a disease that that uh, feeds upon comorbidities, and those comorbidities are, are there. It's a disease that uh, that is highly contagious, and so those situations in which one is in an environment where there's uh, the, the one can 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 contract the disease, and, and blacks are placed in that environment, whether one's a bus driver, uh, janitor, one's in a in a one of these essential positions in which one has to has to be present, places uh, places individuals in uh, locations that that uh, that that these things end up that these diseases can be contracted. And so, um, and so it's very, very important. And the, I guess the third, of course, is that uh, what we see now in the state of Connecticut, for instance, I think it was quoted that 8% of individuals who are white who test, they test positive, over 30% of individuals who are black are testing positive. And it's what we know is that the, um, the level of testing in the black community that's taking place is not, is not sufficient. Um, and, um, and we still see the, the institutional discrimination still taking place uh, where blacks are not being adequately tested, and so, and when they are tested, they're actually being they're they're found to have uh, you know coronavirus at a at a much higher rate. So these are all contributing factors that take place that actually creates an environment where um, where coronavirus is uh, is high in the black community. Dr. Lorenzen, I have a question from Michelle from LinkedIn who asks: You mentioned a la lack of demographic data. How did you get reliable data to draw such confident conclusions? Well, the first is that we were persistent in, you know, there are three answers. One is that we were persistent in demanding. Uh, and so um, I actually spoke directly with the chief medical examiner for the state of Connecticut uh, and asked for the data and said, and, and made it very clear how important it was. Um, uh, some of the data didn't have, uh, didn't have uh, race and ethnicity. I asked that we get that data in terms of that. And in fact, for race and ethnicity, uh, for uh, for deaths from coronavirus in the state, we actually have a fairly high percentage. But the other part of the answer is that that for the cases, we still have issues in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, data on uh, coronavirus cases by race and ethnicity, and it's really all over the country. And we really, in terms of one of the action points, we must demand that we have adequate data on race and ethnicity. Um, we know that diseases such as HIV that start everywhere and start in a number of different communities end up being concentrated in the black black and brown communities. In fact, over 60% of all HIV, new HIV cases each year are in blacks and Latinos right now. Uh, you know, so we know that this is, hap this is what happens in the uh, black and brown communities. And so having that data is important. Uh, the last segment talked about, uh, the, about HIV and some parallels. There are parallels in 1981, the first paper on HIV, HIV came out. It wasn't until two years later that race and ethnicity data was reported by for um, for uh, HIV, and we lost valuable time understanding the changes that are taking place in terms of HIV moving from predominantly a white community to the black community. And so we don't want to make the same type of mistake again. And so I think having adequate data. To track the to track it now and to track it in the future is going to be very, is very important. Uh, Rebecca from LinkedIn is asking a question that I was about to ask you. 
your study was conducted in the United States, but do you believe there would be a variation in these ethnic disparities overseas? Is it happening overseas as well, for example, in the UK or other parts of Europe? Yes, well, what we're seeing is that these same types of disparities are taking place in the UK. Um, and, um, uh, uh, you know, in the UK, they, the group is called Blacks and Other Minorities. And uh, a study has been recently published on Blacks and Other Minorities demonstrating that even though, again, the percentage uh, with the, compared to the percentage of Blacks in the, and other minorities in the country, um, the percentage of Blacks uh, that are uh, in other minorities that are contracting the coronavirus is very, very high. Um, interestingly, when we talk about the fact that uh, they you know, examine the numbers of individuals, a, a major point was the first nine or 10 uh, individuals in the UK who died of coronavirus in terms of health workers were all minority. Um, I know we have to wrap up soon, but I, I just want to just make up one or two, two important points. The first is that I, I believe we have to do things a bit differently than we've been doing it. If we look at what's going on, what's going on right now, we're now going to be passing a million cases of coronavirus in the country, over 50,000 dead. We need to create systems in which we examine and diagnose people earlier. Uh, there's a famous study in Shenzhen, in Shenzhen uh, China, in which they actually looked at the tracer work and found, say, 50 people, 55 people, who were, uh, who were asymptomatic with coronavirus. They did chest CTs on all these individuals and found one third had pneumonias, even though they were, they were asymptomatic. And they advocated early, early treatment. And when they did, pe you know, people got out, got out of the hospital setting very early and none went on ventilators. Um, in New York City, over 90% of individuals who go on a ventilator actually die. And so we need to do everything we can to avoid individuals going onto a ventilator. And we need to, especially if there's capacity, if, especially if there's capacity, we need to have early admissions, even with people who are asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic, um, to allow individuals to be able to be treated and to avoid the complications taking place. And, and, and Dr. Lawrence, I just have to ask you, do you, do you have any solutions or advice for communities uh, that may be more susceptible about how to proactively seek help? Well, I think there are three things. One is that I think it's very, very important that information flow better. And while this is, while having this information is great in terms of going out, um, a number of individuals in the black community won't be watching this. And so we have to have directed, targeted information provided to, uh, to uh, black communities in terms of uh, the coronavirus. And number two is that nationally, we've got to decide where we're going in terms of the coronavirus. On one hand, we've got shelter in place. On the other hand, we've got the beaches are open. And so we've got to really have a, a real uh, national policy in terms of you know, how we're going to be able to combat the coronavirus and, and move forward and make sure that's in the community. Third is that we need to have adequate testing. You know, the testing in the, in the black community is very, very poor. And we need to make sure that testing is available to uh, to those in the black community. Remember, many many of the ways in which one gets tested, going to your primary care doctor with symptoms, then getting a slip to get tested, don't occur. It won't occur in the black community with lower amounts of access to healthcare, lower amounts of insurance that's there. So we have to create solutions. And then lastly, as I mentioned earlier, I think we have to do things a bit, a bit differently. We have to do tracer technology. You have to use tracer technology to trace those that are that um, that uh, the first degrees of, of those after in, in infection. We have to provide early treatment. Early treatment is so important, even with a pop up tent hospitals uh, with early treatment to be able to prevent the types of complications that we're seeing from coronavirus and, and, and the death rates that we're seeing in the black community. Dr. Lawrence, and thank you so much. It's so important to have your voice in this. And, and I want to let you know, I've been told that J&J &J is working on some treatment options for the population you've been studying. And we'll be discussing more of that uh, on this show in future episodes. So keep submitting your questions at jnj.com slash road to a vaccine. And we'll be answering more on Tuesday next week live uh, on another episode. Now, you know, it's it's often the most difficult times that bring out the best in us. Uh, so I wanted to highlight a few everyday heroes who are making a difference in their communities. So before we go, check out the short video uh, and thanks so much to our guests and to everyone for watching.
it was the absolute least I can do to show my appreciation and help spread some sweetness during this time. We really wanted to get involved to give back to the people that are putting their lives at risk for us. We're in this together. Thank you. The fact that there's so many hardworking people just going to work, we wanted to be sure to show them how much we really appreciated them doing everything they can.